Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? You can't hear me? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Bill, you and Alan, you hear me? Very little. Hmm. Move it up higher here. Okay. All right. Good to have everyone. And if you can't hear now, let, let us know because get the volume right. Good to see everyone. I'm glad that you've braved the traffic on Signal Mountain. It's been an interesting weekend, I'm sure. Uh, I hope uh, today that uh, things will start to turn a little bit back to normal. Let's talk about this morning. Uh, I, I want first thing I, I want to just house, housekeeping your handouts. Uh, everyone have a handout, I hope. And so we, we have a few extra. And there are some downstairs uh, there. I think they'll be either on the foyer table or on the stage uh, at, at the end. Before we start, let's say a word of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we're so thankful for this morning and we're thankful for the blessings that You give us and this blessing of being together this morning to study Your Word. Father, we're so thankful for these mighty and weighty words of Paul that were written with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, we, we're thankful that we are free as Christians from, from wrath and from sin and from the law and from death. Be with us. Give us an open mind this morning and help us to use these words to be able to reach others as we study. And may it give us a great foundation uh, in, in the faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, sure. That'd be great. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Passage today is Romans 6, 15-23. And you say, well, how can you take an hour to go through nine verses? Actually, I think, Brent, we need a little bit more than an hour to do <laughs> I think this. So. so there's a lot here. For context, I'd like to read uh, the, the entire chapter. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that, the grace, so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in sin any longer? Or don't you know that... Listen to these words. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like this, how are we united? We've already said that, right? Verse 3 and 4. We will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we, all, we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace." Now, today's passage, starting with, with verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey your heart from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. 
You've been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very quick, high-level summary. Where we've been in the study of Romans. First of all, chapter 1, we talked about the benefits of the Gospel and then immediately went into the horrible sins the Gentiles were, were, uh, were actually, uh, the, the sinfulness of the Gentiles. The second chapter, we talked about God's chosen people. They had all the benefits of the law, the, the covenant, uh, God's leading all through their lives, and yet they also were subject to sin. They were not free from sin. Chapter 3 ties it all together and says, all have sinned and become short of the glory, and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is a remedy. And then chapter 4 talks about the special cases of Abraham and David and the righteousness the way they received righteousness and how it was credited or imputed to them by God. And chapter 5 started really the, the first of four chapters which are talking about free from. Chapter 5 was we're free from, sin, from God's wrath. God's love and justice was demonstrated that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Chapter 6 we talked about last week, uh, the first 15 verses. We're free from sin. In this chapter we're talking about we're free from sin. So we'll, we shared in, 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 in sharing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection means that we are no longer slaves to sin. So now we're going to break up the, these nine verses into two parts. Brent's going to take the first section, verses 15 through 18. And then we're going to follow with some applications. Well, I think here in, in Romans 6, Paul is he is helping us uh, have a right understanding, right, of God's plan of salvation by grace through faith. Because he knows that without this understanding, we're likely to end up in, in one of two, two mistakes, right? Uh, we're likely uh, to either end up in kind of a works-oriented mindset, a works-oriented way of being saved, or we're going to end up in the other error, which is just using grace as a, as a license to sin, right? And I really think those are the two, two extremes, the two errors, the two ditches on either side of the road, if you will, that we can fall into. I think that's what he's addressing here in chapter 6. So there are those who say, why even bother? Why not, why not just sin all you want, right? Wherever your sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Right? By the works of the law, no one's going to be justified anyway. And so why not just take that to its ex extreme and just say, sin all you want, it doesn't really matter. Right? That'd be one error that people have fallen into. And I think the other error he's going to address in our section today is more those who would say that, that grace is not sufficient by itself without the law to promote obedience, to promote a righteous lifestyle. If you don't have the law telling you what to do, if you're just under grace, if you're free from the law, that's not going to do it. Right? So I kind of see those as the two, two errors he's trying to address. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I was just talking to Stephen. I've been so grateful for this class and for this chance to, catch, to, to camp out in Romans because I know Romans is so deep and I've... My understanding of it has been so deficient for so long, so I've just been grateful for the chance to think about it uh, like this. But, you know, God's plan of salvation is so marvelous. It is so perfectly suited to the human condition and where we are. Not only to free us from the guilt of sin, right, but to free us from its dominating power and to bring hope and joy and transformation into our lives. And so from Satan's perspective, what, what can he do in the face of such a perfect plan that's so suited to everyone? All he can really do is make you misunderstand it, right? If he can distort it, if he can twist it, if he can blind you to its beauty, that's what he wants to do. And I think Paul is addressing that in this chapter here. So we can kind of think about it in those terms. Let me go ahead and, and reread. I'm going to pick up in verse 14 just for the context of what we're going to start talking about in verse 15. He says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone 
as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So here in verse 15, we can see that his question flows out of the statement that he just made in verse 14. And really, our section today, verses 15 through 23, really parallel what was covered last week in verses 1 through 14. Very, very similar structure, right? Both questions, uh, both sections started out with a similar question, right? And both immediately followed that question with this impassioned denial, right? By no means. And then both sections follow up with a question regarding our, our conversion. Do we understand what happened our con at our conversion when he says, do you not know? In the earlier section, like, do you not know that when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death? Right. Here again, he, he follows up with another statement. Do you, do you not know? Um, the questions in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 6 and verse 15 of chapter 6, are both, they're very similar, uh, but they're not identical. And again, this goes back to the two extremes I was just mentioning. And, and Galatians 5 is a, a parallel passage you could look at to see this idea brought out even more, this idea of the two extremes of legalism and of, of license, if you will. Um, the legalist, legalist thinks that there can be no restraint of sin without law, that you just opened up the floodgates of sin by taking someone out from under law, and that grace really can't promote the healthy living. And of course, Paul knows his statement that we are not under law is, is especially prone to misinterpretation, right? And that's, that's why he's launched into this section here. <clears throat> of course, the critics, the, those who would say that law is necessary, would say that even if the law can't present or can't prevent sin, at least it causes man to take sin and holiness seriously, right? Um, and so they would say, you know, without law, man is just going to sin, but just with a better conscience if he doesn't have law. So that's the question we're dealing with here in verse 15. Verse 16, do you not know? You know, Paul's question here seems to imply that what he's about to say should be common knowledge. You don't seek, seek out a master and then just go about doing your own thing. Right? That's, that's not the way it works. He's, he's speaking at a time where many, if not most, of his audience actually were slaves in Rome, right? Rome was mostly slaves. These people understand the, the institution of slavery. Uh, and I think what he's going to do here, and we'll see this in just in a few minutes, he's going to go on and show that our conversion was a commitment to God, presenting ourselves to God as slave, his slaves, right? That was involved. That was a commitment we made at our, at our conversion, as well as being, it wasn't just salvation from sin. It wasn't, look, you're free from the guilt of your sin. That's it. As if you could be independent and autonomous on your own. At your, at your baptism, at your conversion, there was this commitment made. Do you not understand what was, the significance of what was going on at your conversion? So based on verse 17, um, do you not know, just like back in, in verse 3 of this chapter, do you not understand the significance of your conversion? You presented yourselves as slave to God, obeying from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were committed. So the, the conversion of the Roman Christians, like we said, is an act of obedience. It was uh, renouncing their former lives of sin and submitting themselves to God. And so the, the, the demands, if you will, of discipleship were not a surprise to these saints. They knew what they were getting into, right? When they obeyed the gospel, they understood that. And I think for today, you know, when we present the gospel to people, is, is that clear to people as well? Do we make that obvious? Do we make that, that clear, what they're doing at their baptism? You are submitting yourselves as slaves to God. I think it's very easy today for the presentation of the gospel to kind of minimize the idea of commitment, minimize the idea of repentance, thinking it's going to be more attractive to people. If we only speak in terms of what God does for us, and not at all about in terms of our response to God because of what he has done for us. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Uh, notice, notice the wording in this verse. God is the one who is thanked for their obedience. They weren't thanked for their obedience. God was thanked for their obedience. And they were committed 
to the form of doctrine. The doctrine was not committed to them. They were committed to the form of doctrine. This form or this pattern of teaching that is referred to here, um, you know, what is, what is he talking about there? Well, I've, I've already mentioned what I think it is. If you look at the parallelism between, again, the first half of chapter 6 and this, uh, in, my, in my view, you see that it's baptism, right? Baptism is what separated or stood between us being slaves to sin in verse 17 and us being freed from sin in verse 18. And if you go back to the first half of the chapter, those who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death, that's in verse 3, and the one who has died has been freed from sin, right? That's verse 7. That was the significance of their baptism. I believe he's referring back to the very same event here in the second half of this chapter. So just like in the first half, he's going back to the significance of their conversion experience, to baptism, and just, and just saying, do, do you understand what was going on there spiritually? It's, it's much, much more than a physical act. There's a spiritual transaction taking place there. Do you understand the significance of what happened there? Verse 18, having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You know, he only mentions two options here, right? You're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of righteousness. He's taken up the question about whether or not being under the law is going to open the floodgates of sin, right? That's, that's the concern. He says, no, no, it's not. You're actually slaves of righteousness, more than just free from sin. You are a slave of righteousness. Uh, you know, there really is no such thing as human autonomy. The idea that man is Lord and master of his own life, he's free from the influences of, of anything outside of him. Um, the idea that, that that is an option is, is an illusion. Man is a created being. We were made. <laughs> we didn't come into existence on our own. We were made by God, right? And so the question is not whether or not we will have a master. The question is which master will we serve, right? That's the only option before us. And service to one excludes service to the other. And very much like what our Lord said in, in Matthew 6. He says, no one can serve two masters, right? And even though there are many people who consider themselves free, and consider themselves the masters of their own destiny, uh, really they're, they're slaves of sin, right? It is, it is a common uh, trait or characteristic of bondage to sin that the one who lives in it imagines that he, um, that he isn't free. But notice here that deliverance from sin does not come by our mastering sin. Deliverance from sin comes by our changing masters, right? We don't, we don't master sin. We can't master sin. We can submit to God as our master, and that is our way out of enslavement to sin. But this idea, this idea of being freed from sin, we're going to save that for our discussion at the end to explore that, because that's a critical, critical thing to know what it means and what it does not mean. And so we're going to save that for the end. So, Steve? Uh, I, it was, struck me, and one thing that you said uh, was that this passage really does parallel first, you know, first verse you know, from the first 14 verses chapter. And I guess from there you sort of think that also the comments for the, first, the last four verses is going to parallel what you just said. So there's going to be a lot of repetition. Don't blame Brent and Steve for this. Blame the Apostle Paul, okay? Because he does this. He wants everybody to make sure he understands what's, what's being said here. So uh, you're going to probably hear a lot of the th same things that, that Brent just said. Let's look at verse 19, uh, and, and I can read that, but just read the passage again, 19. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 19, Paul is, is really saying, I'm speaking in human terms. I don't know what your translation says, but I think that's a signal to his readers that he's going to use an analogy and though it's not very perfect, uh, he's going to use it anyway. And he's talking about, as Brent mentioned, the practice of slavery. 
and really the, the impact of slavery on two different outcomes in life. Paul's very clearly spoken here. Uh, a Christian is a slave who's changed masters. When you sin, you are in actual bondage to sin. When you serve the righteousness of, righteousness of God, you really find actual freedom. This analogy is also a little bit imperfect because if someone is freed from the slavery of sin, it, it means that they might abuse their uh, opportunity or freedom from sin to sin even more. And, and Brent addressed that. Uh, if they do that, then they live without any standards at all. I'm free, hey, hey, to do anything I want to do. No morality, no values. I'm, I'm set free. But in reality, as Brent said, Christians can have no master but God. We can't give part of our life to God and part of our life to the world. With God, it's really all or nothing. And we can't be a partial follower. Jesus famously said in, a, in another context, a man can't serve two masters. Paul says that the Christian life is free only as a slave to God and to serve God with his life. And he encourages his Christians to recognize that faith in Christ necessarily and naturally propels you to a life of service. The Christian life means surrendering yourself to the power of God's Spirit at work in the world and cooperating with God for helping Him do the work that we need to be doing for mankind. These are a contrast in these verses between old and new. He compares living in an impure, lawless, immoral world with living in a world that is clean and pure and holy. This pagan world that he addresses, and the world we live in today, unfortunately, is lawless in the sense that people tend to sort of make up their own laws and they sort of make it up as they go along. We see this all the time. We see the result even in our society in that lawlessness begets or produces even more lawlessness. Uh, people start to think about ways in which they can sin even more. Uh, it's kind of easy to understand this and see this from our perspective to see what Paul was also facing in the Roman world. To continue on the road to sin means that you can spiral downward, 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 downward. You know, it's a, it's a path that leads to ultimately, what, death and destruction. Now, Justin Martyr was an early Christian writer, and he was in a debate with some uh, pagan, pagan uh, philosophers, very immoral, you know, said, for, you know, there are, no, there are no rules, no restrictions on life. And this is kind of a graphic scene, but he writes, uh, we wrote to them and he said that he addressed a practice that happened in Rome, and that was that unwanted children, particularly girls, boys were more valuable, like in the Chinese society, than, than girls. But, but uh, unwanted girls would be left in the Roman forum to either starve to death or his, uh, these people would pick them up, unsavory characters would pick them up, we would call them human traffickers today, and sell them to houses of prostitution. Now, as his opponents frequented these places, Justin Margu argued how bad their sin was that he said it was a very real chance that they might even have sexual relationships with their own children. He was trying to really say, this is very graphic, but this is where you've come to, and this is where your philosophy leads you. Paul was writing this letter from Corinth, and he, perhaps he was influenced by the attitudes that we know about the Corinthians in sin, right? And I think he was a little bit concerned that his gospel message might not take. So in his mind, he was saying, when we walk as Christians, we yield our whole selves to the service of God. We don't abuse our newfound grace and God's righteousness and freedom in Christ to sin, but rather we find it we should find it as an opportunity to unselfishly minister to other people. When we're justified, what point are we justified? Hmm? When we have faith. But how is that evidence? Chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Okay, thank you. Baptism, right? At that point, we are justified. And at that point, uh, we are buried and raised with Christ. We begin, we were justified, we receive righteousness, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we begin the sanctification process, which sets us apart from the world. That should energize us in the Spirit of God as we become God's own. Now, one thing to consider here is the way that a sinner approaches sin, and I'm going to again repeat something that Brent said. The sinner can approach sin many times with eagerness and joy, you know, fun, oh boy, uh, even though it really truly means genuine bondage to, to the sinner. I think we have to be honest with ourselves and compare it to the Christian life. If a sinner 
approaches sin with eagerness and joy, uh, I'll use a Paul phrase here, how much more should we as Christians throw aside any weariness we have or apathy or, oh boy, got to do this again. <sighs> uh, how much should we throw that attitude aside and approach you know, what our life with God have the same eagerness and joy that the sinner has? After all, we have, you know, we have genuine freedom and not, sl free, it's not slavery to sin. Take a look at verses 20 through 22. Paul's expanding on the two spheres of life he discussed in chapter 5 when he talked about the first man, Adam, and then the second Adam, which was Christ. Life under Adam means or meant, and it means slavery to sin. Living under the first Adam means rejecting God's righteousness, rejecting reconciliation with God, and, and that, that, that's part of, you know, that's, that's part of the, the sin um, eon that, that Adam brought us. You can live either under Adam, alienated from God, which results in death, or under Christ, reconciled to God, which results in life. It's your choice. But when Paul says that we are in Christ or free from sin, there's a misunderstanding here oftentimes. He doesn't mean that Christians are sinless in the usual sense of the word. And he doesn't also mean that Christians are relatively, sort of, maybe, possibly, sort of righteous, and our task is to approach closer and closer to absolute sinlessness on the basis of our own works, through exercising our own moral energy, you know, that kind of thing. I think Paul really means what he says. And that's the fact that in Christ, we belong to Christ. We've been made free from sin, and since Christ is Lord, we no longer stand under the dominion of the power of sin. When we have faith in Christ, we're free from all the powers of destruction in the former age. Wrath, this week's sin, we're going to be talking about law and death in the next few weeks. It's no surprise, though, to any of us, when we're free from sin, we still have a constant battle with sin. At the same time he declares we are free from sin, Paul stresses that it's necessary for us to every day continue to battle against it. Since we now live for God in Christ, Sin no longer has power over us, but Paul warns us that in our sinful bodies, they must not control us, we must keep them in check. Precisely because we're free from sin, we have to fight against it. And if you think about it, it's kind of interesting that only through Christ, only the people who through Christ have been freed from sin can truly enter the battle against sin because it's our, our status as a slave of righteousness. I think this passage has been misinterpreted by many commentators probably from the fact that sin, they don't understand sin the way Paul understands it. Paul understands sin as a power of destruction. It holds us into bondage until Christ comes and sets us free. Many commentators get thrown astray when they think about sin as being moralistic things that we do wrong. You know, little things that we do or big things that we do wrong. When Paul refers to sin, Paul sees it, it's really a power of the universe, a major power of the universe. Not, and so don't, you know, they, they, they kind of go off track on this, on, the, on this passage. Look at verse 22. In contrast to life under Adam, life under Christ means that we live through faith and trust in God's redeeming love. It means we have fellowship with God and a healthy relationship with our fellow man. You know, it's not theoretical, just God. You know, it's also our fellow man, and, and particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have that healthy relationship. It means freedom from the power of sin, which gives us the opportunity to serve God. That allows us the opportunity to serve God. The Greek word, uh, the Greek word for in righteousness meant that simply how, how the Greeks defined righteousness was giving God and man their fellow due, right? Uh, you, you give God His due and you give fellow man His due. And this should play out, I think, this understanding really in the way we live under the demands of God's love. We should try to let love reign in every interpersonal relationship. Even those people who are hard to love. I'm sure nobody else has some people in their family or friends or acquaintances that are hard to love, you know? We, I think we all probably, I'm not going to ask for hands to raise, but, you know, there are people, honestly, that are sort of hard to love. But this love may not even be returned when we try, but we, I think we have under Christ an obligation to try to love even the people that are hard to love. 
Well, what's the return for this life of love? It's called a magic word I've already mentioned called sanctification. It's a life set apart for the glory of God. Now, don't misunderstand. Sanctification is, is not, it's not moral perfection by working to make ourselves more holy because if we think about that, that would make God's grace completely unnecessary. Sanctification means that we stand only by God's grace. So in so standing, we, we can attain eternal life. The Greek word for sanctification means that it's a continuing process. You don't get there. Penny alerted me to, to an illustration. And you, you kind of look at sanctification as a road you're walking, which is taking you toward a destination. And it's been said that in our Christian life, the, the direction we're facing is often more important than the stage that we have achieved. Once we're in Christ, now how do we get in Christ? How do we start sanctification? We talked about that, verse 3 and 4, right? Baptism. Uh, we're justified. Again, we have God's righteousness. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And at, at that point, we start the, the process of sanctification on the road to holiness. Will we stumble on that road? I think probably I'll, I'll make the, I'll, well, I'll speak for me. I will stumble on that road today. You know, I can probably say I will somehow stumble on that road today. But the, the key on, in sanctification is that you keep walking with the Spirit as your guide. On the road, you don't jump over the, Brent mentioned this a little earlier, you don't jump the guardrails. You don't start walking in the weeds on the other side. You don't jump the guardrails and walk to another road that leads away from God. You don't turn around and go back from where you came. You stay devoted to walking on that road toward God with the Spirit leading you. Okay. Verse 23 sort of concludes the concept of the two spheres of life. Just a couple more quick comments. The payment for sin is death, but a free gift of God results in eternal life. Again, when, when Paul re, re, refers to sin, sin and the law are working together. We'll talk a lot more about that in the next two weeks. But Paul speaks of a wage which sin pays its slaves. And that wage is a delivery over to death. Think of sin as an Uber driver that delivers us to the front door of death. All right, that's a nice little thought there. As sinners, we get what we deserve. It's important that Paul uses two military terms here. And he talks about, in your translation, it may be pay or it may be wages, right? Pay was the soldier's pay, something that a, a soldier earned by service and something that couldn't be taken from uh, some, some fish, maybe some cooked meat, and maybe a little spending money. That was a Roman soldier's pay. It was what he earned. The, the Greek word uh, gift is, today we call it charisma. It's a Greek word, but it was gift. And that is a totally unearned gift, which the army would pay for special occasions such as the birth of an emperor or, or the birthday of an emperor or maybe pay for a successful campaign somewhere by the Roman army somewhere else in the world. It was a bonus. It was not expected. It was not anticipated. Okay, God does not pay wages. He's not obligated to anyone. Rather, He freely gives eternal life. This is a free gift, and it has nothing to do with merit or reward because of the goodness or because of our works. It's free given to us because of our faith in Christ. And through Him, we are free from sin and sharing eternal life. One way you might paraphrase Paul here and sum it up by saying, if we got the pay we earned... It would be death. But out of His grace, God has given us life. Okay. Uh, I want to, we, we've talked about, hopefully you've been sort of following along and looked at some of the questions as we've been following along on your sheet. I would. Steve, don't you think this is a, a further um, use of the slave analogy? Yes. Because what is a slave, what wages does a slave get? Right. At the, end of the, at the end of the bondage, they die. Exactly. Right? The master doesn't give them anything. Right. And yet our master gives us the free gift. And I think that's where he's showing that the two, the two masters that you're choosing to serve, one is going to end what you're going to get. Right. And the true master will give you a gift. And it's a, it's a pure gift. And it's right. Pure gift. Exactly. That's perfect. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely. Okay. Uh,
one thing I want to point out on our, our handout uh, here is that, again, we're not going to go through some of these questions. These are meant to help you if you were later on to use Romans as a study with someone. But I, I want to point out three and four uh, under this section. We're not, going to, we're not going to open these up. We're not going to talk about them particularly right now. But I think it's something that we see in our everyday lives. I hear that a lot with, with friends and, and others, you know, acquaintances I've known. And it, it is the, the two, two questions about, you know, baptism is just an outward sign of an inward grace. Uh, it's, it's sort of optional and it's, you know, a symbolic act. And then you hear a lot about today about, uh, particularly if you watch Christian TV at all or something, you hear about the sinner's prayer a lot. And so, you know, I think with this study and looking at what we've, what we've talked about in, in Romans 6, I think you, we're given a little bit of a foundation for how you, you would answer uh, questions like that. Any? Very good. Um, just with the last few minutes that we have, I'm going to try to open it up uh, for discussion. Anybody that wants to comment. And I want us to, to discuss the idea, and Steve addressed this very well already, the idea of freedom from sin. And I want you to think about what has Romans 6 taught that helps people understand their experience from sin, their experience with sin, both the unbeliever maybe, maybe an unbeliever who thinks my life is so messed up I can't imagine me ever not being addicted, not being in bondage to sin, or the other side, even the believer who comes to this chapter and says, you know what, I don't feel like someone who's from sin. Am I even legit? Am I even a real believer? with what I'm going through. How has what he has said here in chapter 6 help us to counsel someone who's, who's maybe thinking like that? What, what has he said that's helpful, that sheds light on our experience with sin? That we later feel ashamed of. Okay. That's absolutely true. Yes. That's Yes. That's true. That's true. Yes. So, but, you know, I like that Uber analogy. I'm taking an Uber to the Uber road leads to death, and I think it's Link. The Uber's competitor. Lyft. I think Lyft. it's Lyft. Yeah, Lyft is their competitor, I believe. So if I want to ride, if I'm going to ride with Lyft to the door of grace and eternity and life, uh, but in order for me to do that, I got to die to self, hmm. right? I, I, the, so Satan, the great deceiver, says. Hey, take take Uber, right? That's more fun. You can do anything you want. But God says, take Lyft, and I'll lift you up in into heaven. But you know you're going to have to die to your lust, Adam and Eve. Don't go grab that apple from that tree or whatever the fruit was. So, so I think that's part of it too. Is well, do I want to, Satan being the great deceiver? Hey, come over here. It's a lot more fun. You don't want to die to self over here. Right, take this ride, mm -hmm. and we're and he deceives us into thinking that that's a I can still go to heaven if I ride on his road, and the, you're, you can't serve two masters, right? So yeah, this is really good. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this people downstairs. Okay. Um, yeah, free people. When you're free. We, if we're a free nation, we still have to have an army to protect ourselves and keep our freedom. And when you're free in Christ, you still have to fight. You still have to do war with the enemy who tries to take away your freedom. And that's what we need to perceive of sin, is it's coming to take away our freedoms. Um, I'm, I'm, and actually, by in being in Christ, I am free to, to choose not to follow Christ, but I lose everything that I've gained or He has blessed me with in the process. So don't get off the lift, you know, and join the Uber on the other way. And even though you're free to do so, uh, God does not strip us of our choice after He saves us. I just had a quick thought about that uh, with the Uber analogy that we're talking about. In the road to sanctification, maybe we're, we're riding in the, the lift the sanctification now with our increased technology. We're not walking, but <laughs> okay. so the same same idea. Don't don't get out of the car, right? Don't jump over the guardrail. Is, is sanctification an automatic thing? Is that the experience of people in this room? You became baptized, and sin was no longer an issue. Does does this chapter teach that though? Is that what freedom from sin means? Does that mean is that there's a struggle? I mean, why would he, in the same chapter that he's saying you're free from sin, 
you're a slave. Why would he encourage you? Don't yield your members as instruments to sin. Yield yourselves as your members as instruments of righteousness. Why is he even given those kind of commands and those kind of encouragements if it didn't imply that you still have choices, right? There's still a struggle. You're, you're still in the flesh. You're still in the world. Satan still has access to you. Now, God has done something significant, right? Sin is not your master. That is the reality for Christians, right? That means you can fight now. But telling someone who's a slave to sin, to resist sin, that's like telling someone who can't swim and they're drowning, well, swim to the shore. They can't swim. They can't swim to the shore. If you're a slave to sin, if you're a slave to Satan and to sin, you can't stop. It's bondage. That's what it means. You can't fight it, right? And so for Christians, I think we need to have a very understanding and sympathetic I mean, we were from there, right? We should know that. But we shouldn't look on non-Christians who sin with, with disgust or any kind of pride because, because that's the reality. That's what slavery and bondage to sin is. And until Jesus sets you free, that's where you would be too, right? Go ahead. The, the illustration that Jesus gives, sorry, the parable of the weeds among the wheat mm. is, is also true. There are going to be people in, the, in claiming to be in Christ and actually haven't been baptized into Christ who are not going to make it. They're not going to strive. And that's just a fact. So I, I can't lean on my baptism and say, okay, I'm in. I'm good to go. I need to realize what happened in baptism and then work with God. Or cooperate with God. Work out your own salvation, fear, and trembling, for it is God who works in you. That's Paul's theology. It isn't just God is in you and you don't have to do anything. It isn't just work, work, work and get it. It's a cooperative effort yes. with, with us. It isn't a legal effort. It is a cooperative effort with the Spirit yes. of God working in us, though. And uh, we are not off the hook of striving when we enter Christ. And if people mm. enter Christ and they quit, and that does happen, I don't want to quit. And I don't want them to quit. And I want to help try to get them back if I can. But I'm going to keep on going, even if they don't. Yes, I love that idea you brought up of cooperation. I, I think of comparing it with uh, when God told Israel to go claim the promised land, right? I've given you victory. Yeah, these nations are stronger than you, and there's giants, and they've got weapons and armies. You're really no match for them, but I give you victory. But, but Israel still had to go out on the battlefield and face them. And if they did, they won. God gave them victory. But sometimes they were afraid to even engage. And when they didn't, they were enslaved by their enemies, right? It's the same kind of thing, a similar kind of thing here. In the Christian struggle with sin, God has, uh, God has given us power, victory to overcome, but there's a, there's a struggle, and a struggle is part of the process. And, and a Christian should not give up and be discouraged because of, of the struggle, right? We need to understand that's, that's part of it. So this idea of freedom from sin is not saying it's a cakewalk for you, and if it's not, there must be something wrong with you. I don't think that's what he's, what he's saying here. See? Well, Jesus had a couple of parables talking about counting the cost before becoming his follower. Um, you know, he, that's something that I think we need to emphasize sometimes when we study with people is that there is a cost to becoming a Christian. There is effort that needs to be made. I, I still remember um, shortly after baptizing someone, just their plan of I didn't know it was going to be so hard. Hmm. Um, I didn't know it, there was just going to be so many struggles. There's going to be so many hardships coming our way. And I think we need to make sure we emphasize that as we study with people that there is a cost. There is effort. There's, there's a whole lot of effort that's going to be made. Very good. Anybody else want to add anything? It's time to define, finish the race, complete the course. Hmm. It is a race, it is a course, it is a life. Right. Keep walking or, or riding, to use your analogy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely true. You, Paul, Paul still has a lot more to say about this, right? He's not even right. gotten to this part where he talks about the Spirit of God and his, his role in our life. But I think sometimes <laughs> people come to chapter 6 and look at this as, as a how-to section on a sanctified life. And I, like I said, I think he's still <laughs> helping us understand God's plan of salvation. There's still more practical application. That's going to come later. This right. is still just helping us understand the understanding God's plan and avoiding the, the extreme errors that we talked about. But I know there have been, you know, sincere believers that come to this chapter and, and they get discouraged because it, it seems so out of line with their own experience and they don't know how to harmonize what the Bible's saying with their, with their experience in life and they get discouraged. And so I, I can say that's why I hope this helps us a little bit, you know, to, to see some of what it means and some of what it, what it doesn't mean. And as you said, stay tuned because yeah, he, he's, more to still, be said. he's yeah. still building his, his argument. Yes. It's coming.
Yes. I think sometimes in the, especially in the churches of Christ over the years, I think we have diminished the power of the Spirit because we're really kind of afraid. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit too woo-woo. We're not quite sure where the line is. If there is a line, and how far am I close? To, you know, how close am I to it? We don't have control. And we don't have control. And so, I mean, how many battles did the Israelites win by walking around the wall and blowing a trumpet? They didn't do anything. They relied fully on the power of God. And we have within us the power that raised Christ from the dead. Amen. And we're sort of like, I don't know about you. You know, this is a little bit too touchy-feely woo-woo for me. Mm -hmm. So we diminish the power to fight the fight for us. All I can say is amen. <laughs> well said. All right, well, our time, our time is up. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, please. Holy Father in heaven, thank you again for this class time. Thank you for this message of Romans, Father. Please, please bless our efforts and open our eyes and help us to understand the marvels of your plan of salvation. Father, help us to uh, uh, overcome any misunderstandings and misconceptions we have about it that might discourage us and just see it for its, for its beauty and for its marvel. Father, help us to en encourage one another uh, in this endeavor, to encourage one another, Father, in our, in our struggles with sin and uh, in, our, in our walk with you, Father. I thank you for everyone present here today for their interest in spiritual things, for their love for you, and ask your blessings upon us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.